I'm here with our Father Robert Barron with uh, Word on Fire. The network has shown some of your work. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you just gave the keynote address here at the Love and Life Center. What did you talk about in your address? Well, I talked about Jesus Christ was my main topic, but I tried to weave in the uh, series I've just finished, the 10-part documentary about the Catholic faith. But I talked about Jesus and the message of the gospel, which is the message of the resurrection, and all the power that that message unleashes. And I tried to show how our series is meant to capture some of that in showing the whole texture of the Catholic life. So that was the topic. What a thrill, though, to be here. I've never been to World Youth Day before. And just to catch the enthusiasm of the young people was uh, thrilling to me. What is the, uh, what message, when you work with young people or preach, what is the, what kind of message do you try to give them? That they're the bearers of this great dynamite of the church. They're the bearers of this great energy of the church, and they've got a call to evangelize. Um, we have to overcome this privatized sense of religion, which is so prevalent in our country and in the West and I want them to be bearers of it to the world and to do so in all the ways they can. Speaking about it, using the media, uh, trying to be saints in the world. So I just see their energy. I want to tap into that. I want to direct it toward uh, the gospel. Now you have a series coming out on the public TV. Yeah, the Catholicism series is finished now, the 10 part documentary, and we pitched it to PBS in Chicago, where I'm from. And I must say to my delight and surprise, they went for it and they're going to show four of the episodes. I say to my surprise because we didn't do it in a typical objective way. I mean, it's very much of a Catholic insider telling you that Catholicism is a wonderful, beautiful, and true religion. And so I was delighted that PBS picked it up and then they uh, marketed it around the country and over 80 stations now have signed up. So in the fall, it'll be all over the country on uh, public television. So we're thrilled about that. What did make them want to do it? You know, I don't know to tell you the truth. They talked about the professional quality of it, and I really wanted that. I wanted it to be at a very high level. So we used uh, a lot of high-definition photography. A lot of people from NBC World came in because Mike Leonard, who's a Today Show uh, correspondent, was our executive producer. I knew Mike from my work in the parish, and Mike brought with him a lot of the NBC expertise. Um, so maybe that's what they, they noticed was a certain professional quality. Um, but they said that we think it will appeal to anyone of, uh, of faith or even someone who's a seeker. So I said, great. We were delighted. How would you describe your preaching, your style, or how you reach people uh, with the word? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I try to engage the culture. Um, and sometimes we have to stand to thwart the culture when it's really demonic, and sometimes it is. So I do that. But I also try to find the points of contact what the fathers you know, call the logoi spermaticoi, you know, the seeds of the word, which are everywhere. So I do a lot of commentary on YouTube, where I look at books and movies and music and what's going on around, and try to say, well, look, there's something of the faith there, or there's an echo of the gospel there. So I try to use that double approach. I've been taking on the new atheism a lot on my blogs, and uh, I'm fighting all the time with them. So I think you have to stand to thwart that, and you have to fight it. But other things in the culture, you can say, no, no, that's really good, and we should um, highlight it. So I, I use both approaches. What do you see as a threat to our young people with the new atheism? Uh, what's a particular message you counteract? Well, you know, I talk about secularism as a soul shrinking ideology and it just is it's an ideology that sees an awful lot of people in our society and young people are buying into this lie that you can be utterly satisfied in this world with the goods the world offers and i am with augustine you know that our hearts are restless so they rest in god and so I, i'm encouraging young people not to buy that ideology because they know it's false deep down they know it's we all do that we don't find satisfaction purely in the world. And so we're called to a transcendent good, a transcendent truth. So that's a big focus of my um, preaching and my approach. And it's a, it seems like it's a big responsibility on us to model that detachment, right? The church, the believing church really has to model that, don't they? Quite right. We have to, and that's, you know, as priests, that's a large part of what celibacy means, what the priestly witness means, is that you are a living sign that there's a good transcendent to this world and any, any of the goods of the world that actually is the focus of our deepest longing. And so we need that constant witness. And that's, of course, the church's job, too, in the world, is to be that witness. Um, but that's, yeah, the constant challenge. And your analysis of the culture, your commentary on the cultural things, like the movies and all, do you see a trend towards the good or maybe one element of that culture that's tending toward the good? Sometimes, yeah, I think there are 
sometimes very surprising signs of it. So you might be in the midst of a very sort of secular, even even morally problematic movie, and then suddenly, like a flower, up comes something that is is redolent of the transcendent. And this flower emerges that says, wow, it takes your breath away. A good example is that Clint Eastwood movie, Gran Torino, I watched several years ago, that, that climaxes with the most extraordinary kind of Christ figure that I've seen in years in movies. Um, so I, I love to notice that sort of thing and point it out. Even in the midst of a movie, you might say, boy, this thing is, is misleading or it's problematic, but then suddenly there comes, and I think we have to be there to say, look, look, there it is. Yeah. There's a sign of the faith. Yeah. And just the whole... You know, any good story with that as a drama, that has a battle between good and evil, yeah. you know, that speaks of Christianity. Quite right. I mean, that's, that's the great theodrama that the Bible talks about. And yes, all drama participates in that. Whenever you see a moral uh, struggle or a moral aspiration, when someone says, look, I know my life can be about more than this, and they begin aspiring, what they're aspiring to, we know, is God. So we're able to name that more clearly, but everyone feels it in some way. Now, you, uh, you're... You've done a series, or have done work called Word on Fire. Uh, how do you study the scriptures? How do you bring that to your prayer life? Scriptures are central to me. I, I came of age at a time when the historical critical method was all the vogue. You know, we read the scripture in a very kind of detached, scientific way. There's value in that, and we can learn from it. But I kind of went through a patristic conversion. <laughs> When I, I began to read the Bible in the style of Origen, Augustine, Chrysostom, Jerome, and Thomas Aquinas, the great masters. And that opened the Bible up in a whole new way. I think whenever you preach, you almost have to do that. If you, you can't preach out of a purely historical, critical, scientific approach. You have to get into the heart and soul of it. So I try to read the Bible Christologically, as Augustine did. You read the whole of the scripture that's about Jesus, leading to him, tending toward him, speaking of him. Um, and then you open up the multiple senses of the scripture. So I use the patristic method, I would say. What would you, how would you comment on Pope Benedict's homilies, his speeches, his teachings? How would you describe his approach? He's the model. He's an Augustinian. He said, in fact, Augustine is my master. And you see it all through his writings, in his theological approach, but also the biblical approach. The books on Jesus are masterpieces of moving beyond a pure historical criticism into a more Augustinian um, appreciation of the scriptures. So he would be my master, if you want to say, in how to approach the Bible. Um, he gave a talk way back in the late 1980s when he was Cardinal Ratzinger that set the tone for a lot of biblical study now when he kind of called into question the one-sided historical critical approach. And he was a prophet then, absolutely a prophet. People didn't take him seriously in those days. I think they are now. And he himself came out of uh, a historical critical method study in Germany, right? He would have taken it in, certainly, yeah, that's where a lot of it started. Uh, but I think from the time he was a very young man, he was an Augustinian, and, and you see that from beginning to end of his writings. I'm more of a Thomist, I love Aquinas, and he does too, of course, but you, he says uh, Augustine is the master, and you can see that uh, in the style, the method, the content. And he, he proclaims himself an Augustinian yeah. in Milestones, I know he did. He does, yeah. yeah. What? Um, I just forgot my question. What was I going to ask? Oh. What about, uh, he's written two books now, Jesus of Nazareth, part one and two. Yeah. How would you compare the books? I actually enjoyed the first one more. What was your take on it? Yeah, I don't know, I have to think about it. That's a good question. I, I think I, I might share that with you. I like one more than two. But they're both deeply patristic. He's a guy in 2011 who's doing what uh, the fathers did. Um, it's a meditative approach. It's a kind of, it's a theologian who's, who's in a slow, meditative way unpacking the, the scenes. Um, but I might share that with you. I have to think about it some more, but maybe I like one more than two. That's what I, I feel like one kind of came more from him. You could tell yeah. it was really coming out of his heart. And two, was, they're both scholarly. Two, he really yeah. gave us a lot of data and information. And one, I kind of thought we saw the real heart and themes of Benedict. Uh, that I know it helped me understand his, his approach in homily so much more. You start to see his themes. Absolutely. He's a great preacher. I was privileged a couple times. I spent some months in Rome at the North American College, and I could hear him on a regular basis at the Wednesday audiences. And he's a great teacher, but a great preacher. And what strikes me about Benedict, you hear it, I, I hear him speaking Italian in my mind, gioia, gioia, gioia. Joy is his great theme. Yeah. And I know Augustine gets a reputation of being kind of dour or dualistic, but you see in Augustine all the time, what the Christian life is about is joy. How do you find the deepest joy? And Benedict really has that in his preaching. Right. 
And it's funny because his style isn't, he seems to love the Italian culture. Yeah. But his style, I would, you wouldn't call it Italian, you know? No, he's a German, you know, so he had the German style. But I, I love his, um, you know, multifaceted approach. And it's very patristic. It's not reductively scientific, though it's scientific. It's academic. But it's broad, it's rich, it's multivalent. Um, I love that in his preaching and his writing. I know, and he has such confidence, too, in the faith. And when it's led by, he's written beautifully about the holiness of ordinary people and how that is like one of the strongest witnesses of the faith. I know he grew up in Bavaria and very humble background, but he talks about that witness of his parents. Yeah. And uh, he has a way of giving you confidence against this big bad culture, so to speak, you know? Yeah, and that's a key to reading him. I think you're right about his parents and his father who stood against Hitler at a time when it was very dangerous to do so. And I think that's key to Pope Benedict's whole psyche and his mentality. He saw his father especially as standing against a culture that had really gone wrong. And I think he has taken that in very deeply. That, that's a very uh, good insight, I think, about his father especially shaping his consciousness. And this is probably off track, I mean, it's from out of nowhere, but I love the fact that you have a John Paul II just before him, who's from Poland, yeah. that suffered these atrocities yeah. of Nazism, yeah. and Benedict sees it from the point of view of his own country committing that. I know Bavarian, there's a distinction yeah. there, but I wonder sometimes, I could see how that would lead you to, to Augustinian kind of thinking. It could be, you know, of course, John Paul is more Thomist than Augustinian, but I think they both come of age with the Nazi reality and Vatican II as major formative influences. So you're right, they're on different sides of that, you know, uh, politically, but uh, they came of age in that terrible maelstrom of World War II, and then as young men, they participate in Vatican II. And I think that coming together influenced both of them very profoundly. All right, well, thank you so much for speaking you're with me. You're welcome. No, my pleasure.